Hello, I'm Georgia Calvin Smith, and welcome to Across Africa, France 24's weekly roundup from across the continent. This week, Fiduma Daib is the Kenyan born Somali presidential hopeful who knows that she's facing an uphill battle. But she says that she's no stranger to a challenge and hopes to defy conservative norms. Also, we head to South Africa, where traditional healers are up in arms as the government plans to tighten up regulation. And Wax Works. We meet the man who set up shop in Paris's African expat neighborhood. Yusuf Fafana has started selling contemporary styles made of traditional printed wax fabrics. Well, this week we heard from Fadumo Daib, the first woman to set her sights on the Somalian presidency. Now, she's determined to stand up to a system that's long sidelined women. She was in Paris for a conference on the role of African women. And on Tuesday, she joined me on set. I asked her about the hurdles she faced in her political aspirations. We won't have free and fair elections in 2016. We will continue having 4.5 clan system-based electoral um, system, which means the four clans plus the minority clans sharing power. And this is a system that actually shuts out women and the youth. The challenges that I would face in a system like that is the level of corruption is very, very high because 275 members of parliament are the ones who will choose the next president and they often choose through payment and you have to pay quite a lot of money. The other challenge is the challenge of, um, it's a male dominated society. We have, um, for example, Al-Shabaab, we have other groups who feel that a woman's place is either at home or in a grave. And if she cannot stay you know, at home, they will make sure she gets into a, a grave. And then we also have really um, the issue of um, a whole generation that knows nothing else other than war. You know, they don't, they've not had the opportunity to study and, and to, to see um, a stable um, country. If you'll excuse me, it, it does not sound likely that you're going to get very far. So is it for you as important to be seen to participate? My only objective is not really to get into office. It's not to obtain power. My objective is to make sure that we address the inequities that we have in Somalia, the inequality that we have in Somalia. And you do that through instigating social change. What I'm doing is part of that. Getting into office or running to get into office is one of that, because there is a prevalent belief that no woman or even girls should not aspire to this kind of um, positions. And so by really coming forward you know, and, and, and doing this and actually um, being a very credible candidate at that, if we had free and fair elections today, I would like to believe that you know, I would stand a very, very good chance. But unfortunately, we're going through a very corrupt system, which doesn't look at competency, but it only looks at money. So if you really look at what I set out to do, I think I've achieved quite a lot because I get a lot of young women, not only in Somalia, but on the continent in Africa and also globally, who say to me, you know, I for the first time realized that whatever little challenges I was facing, you know, I could deal with. You gave me hope. You inspired me. Faduma Daib there speaking to me a little earlier on in the week. Now, Mauritius is bracing itself for a double threat to its coral reef, climate change and the El Nino effect, which could hit the Indian Ocean later this year. Now, conservationists warn that a likely rise in sea temperature will endanger the island's underwater paradise. It's an underwater paradise, but the coral reefs circling the Indian Ocean island of Mauritius are in danger. Record sea temperatures combined with a strong El Nino put these reefs at risk of coral bleaching, which could kill both the reefs and the marine life they sustain. In fact, we saw that the temperature in the month of December was virtually the same as the temperature in February and March last year. And February to March is the hottest time of the year. So we can see that the hottest period has come forward over time. Corals rarely survive in waters above 30 degrees centigrade. And once they die, it takes years for them to regrow. 
The first global bleaching event was in 1998 and the second in 2010, both in years marked by El Niños. Mauritius escaped these bleaching events, but oceanographers are worried about the coming year. If ever that phenomenon reaches Mauritius, it will take us 15, 20, 30, 40 years for us to recover. This is a global phenomenon. We've seen, for example, that El Niño starts in the Pacific, but with the South Equatorial Current, the impact will also be felt in the Indian Ocean after a few months' delay. Mauritius' underwater world is its main attraction, bringing in a million tourists a year. As the threat of El Nino looms, worsened by rising sea temperatures caused by climate change, conservationists are left watching these coral reefs, hoping they'll be spared. Well, in South Africa, a new draft law is looking to crack down on the influence of traditional medicine. The government wants much tighter regulation, and that's got Sangomas up in arms. Here in the heart of Soweto, everybody knows this house. This is where Tokozile practices. She's a popular traditional healer known as a Sangoma. She claims to help patients every week with health issues ranging from diabetes to depression. Tokozile is one of 20,000 Sangomas in South Africa. You don't go to school for that. It's a calling that you have to, to help people. You see, from our forefathers, she says it's her ancestors who guide her to cure people and choose the right herbs. The South African government is now asking these healers to register all their remedies, but most of them refuse to give away their secrets. It's wrong because we're not bothering them with their recipes and stuff like that. Why can't they leave us in peace and then let us practice what our forefathers have given us? In Johannesburg, the economic capital, Sangomas have begun to fight back. Members of the Organization for Traditional Healers meet regularly to debate the new bill, which will force them to declare their age, income and proof of training. Government is threatening the profession. Government is putting in place, you know, mad legislation. And this legislation are made to distract us from our core business. Tokozile is worried her business will be affected should the bill become law. Her mother, who has been a Sangoma for 20 years, fears the government will eventually stop them from practicing. And then when the patient dies here, they said, I gave the patient the wrong moti. But when they die in hospital, no one blamed the doctor or the sister or whatever. With 80% of the South African population still consulting traditional healers, passing this legislation could well prove to be an uphill battle. Kung Fu is kicking off in Mali. In another sign of the close ties China has forged with some countries in Africa, the ancient Eastern martial art is attracting more and more Malians from all walks of life. Laurent Berstecker has the story. This isn't a scene from an action movie, but a very real example of Mali's growing martial arts craze. Here, Chinese Kung Fu has become increasingly popular and several schools have recently opened in Bamako. Every day, dozens of Malians come to rehearse their deadly choreography under the watchful eye of Master Sanogo. I started with a Chinese master who came here to Mali. He started teaching me in 1990. He said, Mr. Sanago, one day you'll be competing on the international stage. That's what gave me the courage to start teaching. Pupils start to train barehanded and can eventually learn to wield sticks, swords and even fans. But for Master Sanogo, Kung Fu isn't only about self-defense. By strengthening the body and the mind, he believes martial arts can also teach balance and discipline in everyday life. The sport's widening appeal in Mali is but one sign of the intensified cultural exchanges between China and Africa. A growing number of Malians have also been traveling to Asia to study martial arts. 
The neighborhood of Chateau Rouge in Paris is right at the center of the city's African expat community. Now there, a new label is using traditional African printed wax fabrics to make modern styles. And though it's pretty much still a startup, business is booming. France 24 met with the fashion founder, Youssef Fofana. Every morning, Youssef Fofana tours the Chateau Rouge neighborhood in the north of Paris in search of the finest African wax prints. Diversity of patterns and quality of fabric, for him, every detail is crucial. What's surprising is that it's the traditional fabrics that are the most resistant, and they're the most popular too. Their unique patterns each have their own meaning. And when Yusuf can't decide, Asafo is there to help. She knows the fabrics inside out, down to their sometimes unlikely names. <laughs> they have two or three different names each, depending on the country, Mali, Ghana, Senegal. I'm mostly familiar with the Ghanaian and Ivorian names. This one is called President Kennedy. Youssef launched his brand Maison Chateau Rouge in May 2015, and in under a year, business has flourished. Our website launched late in the night. It was around 3 a.m., and the next day we had orders from Japan and the United States. It's truly an international customer base, but there are also a lot of Parisians, people who live in Chateau Rouge and who wear our outfits with pride. All of Youssef's creations are currently sold out, but worry not. Maison Chateau Rouge's new collection is set to come out on February 27th. Well, that's it for Across Africa for this week. But for more news and headlines from around the continent, remember, you can always join us for Eye on Africa from Monday to Friday. Please do join us again next time if you can. Till then, take care.